Dear Joe Scarborough, I woke up this morning to another one of your yelling rants about Section 230 and why you want to overturn it so you can sue Facebook and Twitter. I was ranting back, but you couldn't hear me, that I wish just once you would have on an expert on Section 230 who can explain the history and the benefit and give the other side of the story. For this, I can recommend no one more than Jeff Kossif, who wrote the, the book on Section 230, the 26 words that created the internet. Or I can recommend Mike Masnick from the site Tech Dirt, or two brilliant legal scholars, Daphne Keller or Kate Klonick, or your buddy Ben Wittes. Any of them could give you the other side of the story that I wish you would understand and hear. Or let me take a crack at it, Joe. Think of it this way. Section 230 enables the public conversation. Without it, we would have one of two bad extremes. Either we'd have no public conversation because the liability to hold it would be too great, or, as was the case in case law before Section 230, hosts of the public conversation would fear touching anything on it because then they'd be classed as a publisher and then they'd be liable and so they would let anything go. Everything would look like parlor. No conversation, awful conversation. That's what Section 230 fixed for us. Because as Senator Ron Wyden, the co-author of 230, says, it gives hosts of the public conversation both a sword and a shield. First, the shield. Yes, this does protect the platforms from liability for anything that some random jerk out there like me puts up on their platform. But it also gives them a sword so they can moderate the comments and get rid of that comment from jerk me, and we can have a better public conversation. It doesn't just protect Facebook. It protects anyone who hosts a public conversation, which means the New York Times. Now, without 230, we'd likely not have Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Reddit, possibly Wikipedia, any of these platforms. Now, you might say good, but I don't. For then we'd be stuck still with big, old mass media run by people who look like you and me, Joe, old white men. Please, please keep in mind that it's because of 230 and the net and the public conversation that we're finally hearing the voices too long not heard in big old mass media. It's because of free speech and the net that we have the hashtags and movements behind Black Lives Matter and Me Too. To kill 230 and social platforms and the public conversation is to turn our backs on those voices too long silenced. Living while black as a hashtag allowed witnesses and victims to tell us the story that has been going on for generations. White people calling the police on black people just living their lives, going to lunch or school or into their homes, possibly ending in a death sentence. As I say, this has been going on for time immemorial, but I didn't know much about it because that story was not covered in mass media because it wasn't happening to the editors of mass media who again look like you and me. It is social media, it is 230 that enables and protects the platforms to host the conversations that let us see this story and understand what was going on even under the story of George Floyd. Social media in Black Lives Matter is leading a racial reformation in America. That is too valuable to give up. Now here I'll recommend a couple other books to you. Distributed Blackness by Andre Brock Jr. and Black Software by Charlton McElwain. They talk about the ability on social media to finally build communities apart from the mass, apart from mass media for black America on the internet. So when you talk about Section 230 and you talk about trying to get rid of it, you potentially get rid of what these communities have finally built online. I think you expect social media to be edited like the New York Times, but Twitter is not the New York Times, it's Times Square, where every day there are smart people and idiots. There are people who are right, and there are people who are wrong. Now, we wouldn't think of trying to edit their conversations or sue the city for what they say there or expect government to intervene and regulate what they say. So why do we expect to do that online? Should the platforms do a better job of creating better environments for respectful, informed, and productive conversation? Yes, absolutely. So should journalism. So should media. We, too, concentrate too much on conflict. It's our attention-based business model for media that corrupted the net. But the platforms are in a, in a pincer right now. The left goes after them saying they've got to take down this hate speech. They take down the hate speech. Then the right says, whoa, that was my hate speech you took down. 
They claim cancel culture and they threaten the platforms. The right-wing regime in Poland is even considering legislation that would require platforms to post any and all speech as so long as it's legal. That would be parlor everywhere. Crippling Section 230 does not help. It hurts the public conversation. Now, I'm working on a book about the end of the Gutenberg age, and I can see from the very earliest days of print that there was hate speech, and there was disinformation. Hell, with print came a 30 years war and witch hunts. And there were efforts to control it. There were efforts to ban books. There were hell. They burned books and they burned the authors of them, but it didn't work. To only concentrate on the negative doesn't get us anywhere. The net is built so far to speak. It also needs to be built to listen. But it's early days. We can do more and we will do more to improve the conversation on the net, but that's not going to come from blaming all of society's problems on the internet and social media and trying to get rid of it in an easy answer. We were a racist, screwed up country before the internet, and we still are. And if we concentrate on the moral panic around social media, we miss the real causes. And while I have you, Joe, let me thank you for also ranting about Fox News. And I urge you to please keep it going. Because I think that in Fox News and in Rupert Murdoch is the single most malign influence in democracy in the English-speaking world. And I've begged MSNBC on the air to start a regular feature. Maybe you could do this. A feature called we watch Fox News so you don't have to. This is what your crazy uncle is being fed and not being fed every day. We in journalism and responsible media need to stand up for quality in our house too. And we need to clean our house before we demand that Facebook and Twitter clean theirs. So perhaps we in journalism can stand together to shame and shun Fox News and do something about that problem too. Thanks for listening, Joe.